180 online. I hope you guys all had an awesome Thanksgiving. My name is Rachel, for those of you that don't know me. Um, I'm a leader here at 180. And I just wanna give you guys a quick reminder that 180 has moved to Thursday nights at 8 p.m. So make sure you guys are subscribed to our YouTube channel and that you're following us um, on Instagram at 180 Student Men so you don't miss a thing. We're kicking off a two week series to close out the year called Twisted Christmas. And tonight's message is brought to you guys by the one and only Miss Jess. So we're finally in the Christmas season and it's personally one of my favorite times of year. I feel like people are happier, uh, more joyful. Um, it's the season that, you know, we celebrate Jesus's birth. Um, so lots of great things going on during the Christmas season. So to kind of kick off the Christmas season, I wanted to share with you guys a few of my favorite Christmas movies. Um, some of them you might know, um, some of them you might not, they're a bit older. Um, so my first is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I've loved this movie since I was a little kid. Um, I hope you guys have seen it. If you haven't, you should check it out. I know it's an old movie, but it's really a great movie. It's a great Christmas movie. Another one is another classic, which I'm sure you guys have seen, which is Home Alone. I love that movie. It's always something I, I have to see every Christmas season also. Um, just a great movie all around. And um, the last one is um, Elf. So Elf is kind of a little bit newer, um, so you guys have probably seen that one as well, but I love Will Ferrell. Um, I think it's really funny and um, it's just super Christmassy and I love it. So um, why don't you guys take a few minutes to share with each other some of your favorite Christmas movies and then um, take a seat, uh, settle in and get ready for tonight's message brought to you by Miss Jess. Welcome to 180 Online. My name is Miss Jess and I'm the 180 Student Ministry Coordinator here at His House Children's Home. And in honor of Miss Rachel's uh, favorite movie, Christmas movie options, I'm wearing my uh, Elf uh, ugly sweater. So if you haven't seen Elf, that's a classic. You need to watch that movie. But, you know, cotton-headed ninny muggins. Um, so I figured I would wear my Christmas sweater uh, for this service uh, tonight. And, you know, never mind that it's barely even cold enough to warrant wearing a sweater here in Florida. But you know how it is, you know, the temperature goes even slightly below 80 and everybody's like breaking out the winter clothes. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this is honestly one of my favorite times of the year. Um, I love Christmas. I just love the vibe to it. I love uh, just everything that comes with it. And I know there are some of you out there, you know who you are, who you know can you know honestly say it's finally okay to play that Christmas music without getting judged. Um, I'm talking to you, Tito. <laughs> but I, I know there's some people who are like, man, I play that stuff year round. Um, but hey, now's your time. You blast that Christmas music. Uh, blast that Mariah Carey. Anyway, so this is the beginning of our Twisted Christmas series. It's a two week series. And over the next couple of weeks, we're hoping to help you uh, basically understand the, impor the importance of the first Christmas and to counter what society is teaching us Christmas really is. Um, more specifically, our hope is to teach you that the story, you know, teach you that the story of Jesus's birth shows us that God offers life of grace and love versus how the world around us offers this sort of works-based performance uh, love. So with all that in mind, we're going to go ahead and kick off our message and we'll just go ahead and title it Santa versus Jesus. Um, kind of like Celebrity Deathmatch, which I think I might have just dated myself. But for those of you who know what that show is, if it's still around, sweet. 
Um, if it's not, um, Google it. Uh, but before we get into our message, let's go ahead and pray. All right, so bow your head, close your eyes, let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for tonight, for this opportunity just to get into your word, to really understand uh, the Christmas story and what it truly means, uh, the impact and the importance and what it really has to do with our lives um, when it comes to uh, our relationship with you, Lord. Um, I pray now that you would just go ahead and just remove all distractions Soften our hearts and open our ears to what you have to share um, with each of us through this incredible story. Lord, we love you and we praise all in your son's name. And everybody said, Amen. Awesome. So I'm going to pose a few questions. All right. Obviously rhetorical because, um, you know, this is technology and you're talking to a screen right now but if I asked you who you know best Santa or Jesus who would you say or to put it another way if I asked you to name some random facts about Santa and then asked you to name some random facts about Jesus who would you be able to name more things about who would you have an easier time naming things about you know, who would be harder to name random facts about? You know, for Santa, I feel like people would be able to, you know, rattle off, you know, what he looks like, you know, his, even his reindeer names, um, stuff like that, you know, where does he live, things like that. But when asked about Jesus, you know, probably a little, you know, a little bit quieter, don't know too much about this guy. So... For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be jumping into the Christmas story. And I'm talking about like the legit Christmas story, the story of all stories, the reason for the season. I couldn't help it. I had to say it. Um, it's cheesy, I know. But it's legitimately, this is a story that is legitimately the reason for this Christmas season. You know, why we actually, in fact, celebrate Christmas. Um, and it's not because of the big fat guy who sneaks into your house and leaves you toys and eats your food. Um, but, and, you know, one thing to consider also, you know, that twist, you know, that, it, again, this is not about Santa. It's not about, you know, um, breaking and entering. <laughs> so, um, so growing up, um, and I think a lot of you can kind of relate, uh, growing up, my parents talked, you know, about both Santa and Jesus. I knew a lot about both of them. Um, none of this elf on the shelf creepiness, because honestly, I think it's demonic and is a straight creepy. This little like elf that, you know, parents, oh wait, I don't know who's like watching this. Don't, well, whatever. Anyway. This creepy elf that ends up in random places, and yeah, that's just, where does that even come from? But whatever. Anyway, I digress. Um, but I grew up knowing both about Santa and about Jesus. I remember leaving out cookies for Santa, but also having multiple nativity scenes set up in our house as decorations for Christmas. So... So here's a question. Now, what does the story of Santa Claus teach us? When you think of the story of Santa Claus and what Santa Claus represents, what does that teach us? Now, apart from the fact that if Santa dies on your property and then you're forced to become the new Santa Claus, no matter how many times you work out or shave that beard and it keeps on growing back, um, if anybody caught that, that's the plot from the Santa Claus movie. Um, although, quite frankly, I'm a little confused about that plot because, I mean, what if Santa fell off an apartment building? I mean, do they just have like a lottery on who becomes the next Santa? Or what about if it's a single mom? Like, does she become Santa Claus? Like, that's a little weird. Like, you know, can you imagine like a lady growing out a beard? But whatever, I digress. Um, 
Ultimately, this Santa story teaches us that good kids get presents and bad kids get coal. Good kids get presents, bad kids get coal. Why coal? I don't know. I should probably research that. Go ahead in the comments, tell me why it is that, you know, Santa gives kids coal. Got no clue for that one. But this is essentially, you know, what Santa, what we learn about Santa. So what makes you good or bad? All right, think about that. What makes you good or bad? Now, I'm not sure how Santa ultimately judges kids as good or bad. You know, is it like a sort of slanted scale, circumstances, things like that? Are there pie charts and, you know, case studies, things like that? Uh, different factors that weigh into, like, is a kid, like, genuinely bad? Or do circumstances play into things? Stuff like that? Or are certain things worse than others or whatnot? I'm not really sure how he judges good from bad. But what I do know is that ultimately Santa's whole story is based off of your works. Or, to put it differently, his story is based so solely off of what you do. It's solely based off of what you do. So think for a moment and put your hands up if you think good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Raise your hand if you think good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Now, if you raised your hand, if your hand's up, most Americans would agree with you. All right, Santa would agree with you being good gets you good things and presents. You know, being bad gets you consequences. Now, here's another thing. Here's another question. Put your hand up if you agree that if you get good grades or if you excel in sports and activities and you're mostly a nice person, then your parents, your coaches, your teachers, your friends, etc. will be proud of you. How many of you believe that? That if you're, you know, you get good grades, you do great, you're good, you know, generally a good person, all these people um, will be proud of you. Raise your hand. Awesome. So if you raise your hand, honestly, you're not alone. All right. Most teenagers uh, feel that pressure to be good in all the things that they do. They have that pressure where it's like, I got to be good at everything. I got to have my stuff together all the time. You know, and quite frankly, heck, I am 33 years old <laughs> and I feel the pressure to be good at everything I do. And let me tell you, it doesn't, you know, I, I'm also a musician and boy, that does not take off the pressure either. So the more things that you add onto your plate, the more that pressure kind of increases. So believe me, students or adults, we all feel this pressure. So you're in good company. You're not alone if you feel that way. Now, here's this last question. All right, raise your hand if you think you're a good, if you're a good person, then God will love and accept you. Raise your hand if you think that if you're a good person, God will ultimately love and accept you. You can go ahead and raise your hand. Once again, if your hand, if you raised your hand to that question, most Americans would actually agree with you. You're not alone. Ultimately, the message of Santa's story is if you're a good person, then good things will happen. You'll get good things. And I'll be honest with you, this way of life is exhausting. All right. You're constantly having to do more good things than bad things and trying to figure out if it's good enough. And if you mess up, then you're, you know, you better brace yourself for impact because that bad thing is coming. It's exhausting. So as we close, you know, we talked about Santa, but here's why Jesus' story is the legit Christmas story. Ultimately, God loves us. 
God loves us, but he doesn't like the bad things that you and I choose to do. All right. God is a holy and perfect being. Um, so consider this, you know, understand this, that God is not just another human being who just lived a good life. God is God. He's in an entire different category all by himself. You know, some, you know, an entirely different category. God is God, creator of the universe. He is perfect without sin. He is holy and he cannot be around uh, imperfection. He cannot be around sin. So naturally, we as sinful beings, you know, our sin keeps us eternally separated from a perfect and holy God. But the thing is, is that God does love us. Scripture says it. It's all throughout Scripture. God does, in fact, love us. It's just those bad things that we choose to do. He doesn't like that. And those are the things that separate us from him. But here's why the Christmas story is so important. Because if you go to Romans 3.23, um, you know, you learn about, you know, the, the consequences and like, you know, the real significance of our sin, what ultimately separates us from God. In Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I want you to zero in on that three-letter word at the very beginning. For all, all, not some, not, you know, a few, not most, not the majority or minority or whatever. It says all have sinned. That means every single person. That means me, Ms. Jess, the leaders at 180, your staff, your teachers, your coaches and whatnot. They've all sinned. So because we've all sinned, we all have this sin in us, you know, we are eternally separated from God. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to zero in on that first part. The wages of sin is death. Now, Romans 3.23 tells us that we've all sinned. We can all agree that we all make bad decisions. We all make mistakes and whatnot. And scripture tells us the consequences of those sins is death. Or to put it another way, eternal separation from God. Because at the end of our lives, there's more than just this. There's more than just all this tangible stuff. All right, there's life after this. And ultimately the goal being that we want to be able to spend eternity with the God who created us, the God who loves us more than we could possibly imagine. But the sin in our lives separates us from him. And the consequences of those sins is death. Now think of this, the story of Jesus's birth is about how you and I are messy people. That sin in our lives, that's our mess. We're messy people. We're messy people who make mistakes, but he came for us to save us from that mess. God sent Jesus to save us from that mess. That's why this Christmas story is so important. Because we have this sin, it separates us from God, and... There was nothing we can do to save ourselves. So in comes Jesus to bridge that gap. To save us from that mess. This last piece of scripture, Romans 5, 8 says this. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God showed his love for us. God loves us. Whether you see it, whether you believe it, all right? Whether you, you, you can not believe it, that doesn't make it any less true, all right? God loves us. Whoever is watching this right now, God loves you. Whatever you're going through, whatever mistake you made yesterday, even today, even just five minutes ago, God still loves you. And even still knowing that you would make that mistake, that you would fall short the way that you have, 
he still sent his son to die for you. So that in spite of your mess, you had the opportunity to spend eternity with him. God wanted to show us that his love that he loves us and still wants a relationship with us. God actually wants a relationship with us. Sure, you know, you may not be able to actually tangibly see him, but at the end of the day, he actually does want a relationship with you. He loves us even if we're messy, and he wants to come and help us be more like him not just expect us to be good on our own not just expect us to be good on our own how many times you know are we you know you make a mistake and they're like maybe in a sport or maybe at school and you're just told hey that's wrong do it again and it's like yo but i don't I don't know what I did. Can you like help me? It's kind of like a teacher telling you, hey, you did that wrong and walking away. That's what the world's doing. That's ultimately what Santa's doing because nobody knows what he's like judging based, you know, deciding how you're, you're a good or a bad kid. It's like, hey, you're a bad kid. And then walking away, it's like, but what do I do to be good, Santa? Yeah. Not just expecting us to be good on our own. He loves us even in even if we're messy. But here's the thing. Before Jesus could die for us, like we've been talking about tonight, he needed to be born. And I hope tonight you saw the significance of why he needed to be born. And now next week, we're going to dive deeper into the true Christmas story. We're going to literally hear that Christmas story from Miss Maya and help you understand it more. Like, why did Jesus have to come and what does it have to do with why we celebrate Christmas the way we do? So here are my challenges for you. All right. First question, what story are you ultimately going to choose to believe? The Santa story where you must do things to earn love and approval, that sort of works performance-based love, or the Jesus story where he knows you're messy, but he loves you anyway. Are you going to choose to believe the Santa story or the Jesus story? And finally, which story do you want to be a part of your story? The story of Christmas being a time of wants and materialistic things that are just going to either break or you're going to lose interest in um, or they're just going to become obsolete and you're just going to they're just going to collect dust in a corner or the story of Jesus marked with humility and lifting up others. Consider those two things. What story are you going to choose to believe and what story you want to be a part of your story? And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pray and we'll close out the night. Father, I just want to thank you for tonight, for this opportunity to refocus Take time just to um, get into your word and really contemplate the true meaning of, of Christmas, the true purpose, the reason why we celebrate this holiday, Father. It's, it's not about the gifts. It's not about the presents. It's not about Santa or Elf on the Shelf. But, Father, it's about the birth of your son, Jesus, who ultimately would die for each and every one of us so we could spend eternity with you, Father. I pray if there's anybody tonight who heard this story for the first time and is like, wow, I want a relationship with you, Lord. Um, I pray now, Lord, that you would just, um, just enter their hearts, um, that they would just reach out to us as, um, as leaders, Lord, and that they would be open to this relationship with you, that they would just commit their lives to believing that 
Jesus came to die for each and every one of them for their sins that uh, eternally separated them from you. But because Jesus died on the cross and rose on the third day, they now have this opportunity to spend eternity with you in heaven, Lord. Father, thank you again for tonight. I pray that this time and discussion over these small group questions, Lord, would just be um, blessing and glorifying to you. Lord, we thank you and we praise all in your son's name. And everybody said, amen. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Pray that you all have a great rest of your week. And if I don't see you, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and I'll see you in 2021. It'll be a better year, God willing. Anyway, love you guys. Peace. Thank you so much for that message, Miss Jess, as we shed light on the true story of Christmas. A reminder, please uh, like, share, subscribe to our Insta and YouTube. Um, and check out these discussion questions and we'll see you guys next week.